The Speaker's Office is delighted to once again to support the annual Parliamentary Staff Awards. So thank you to Prospect Magazine and the Members and Peers Staff Association for making this happen. The awards recognise the dedicated staff behind each and every MP and peer and the work that they do to support the parliamentary and the constituency engagement. The last year has been one of the extraordinary circumstances. All of you have had to deal with an increased workload during a difficult time. Staff have had routinely to stay late, work under pressure or deal with all manner of enquiries, yet still manage to make us look good and ensure the smooth running of our offices. I think the Parliamentary Staffer Awards event is a fantastic way of saying thank you to this set of amazing group of people for what they do for us and the impact that they have on the lives of our constituents. We welcome nominations from MPs, peers, but please know you can also nominate a colleague or yourself and I will encourage all of you to do so. Some of you may only have started work during the pandemic. We are delighted to say there is an award, the Newbie Award, especially for those who did. If you follow the link on the screen, you can register your submission. I wish every one of you success and look forward to meeting some of you at the awards ceremony in November. Hi, welcome to the Parliamentary Staffers Q&A. The third annual Staffers Awards will be held in Parliament on the 9th of November, of, of November and it's kindly sponsored by Octopus. I'm speaking here with Estelle, the office manager to Mark Hendrick and member of the Wellness Group, and Kirsty, head of culture at Octopus, who looks after mental health there. The awards are aimed at recognising the dedication and hard work of all parliamentary staffers. So I'm just going to ask Kirsty and Estelle a few questions. So first of all, when did Octopus begin its wellbeing programme? Um, that was about seven years ago um, and it was born from quite a lot of stressed managers not dealing with what we thought was conflict at that time because seven years ago mental health wasn't really even spoken about or spoken about comfortably. Um, so seven years ago and it was when we started to really investigate so what, what are the problems, what are people struggling with, why how can we make them happy when they come into the workplace? What can we remove or give them the support to be able to help them with whatever they've got going on in their home lives to help them be a better, better version of themselves when they come to work? Um, why did you realise it was needed? Um, so, so again, I was probably, if you've watched Billions, people call me Wendy, don't know if you have, but a little bit of an agony aunt. So I literally used to have people at my desk just really struggling um, and we, we employ really lovely people here it's a real family culture um, and I couldn't kind of work out what was going on I could see the huge volume of work but I couldn't kind of work out why all this conflict was happening um, and the conflict was managers avoiding having conversations because they actually didn't know how to approach a situation when someone was struggling or someone turned up at their desk in tears or you know, someone had a bereavement or whatever the scenario would be. And could you tell me about what the wellness group does? Certainly, yes. So um, the uh, MP Staff Wellness Working Group, or WWG for short, is um, it's made up of staff members. We all work for members of parliament up and down the country. It's totally cross party as well. So it's non-partisan. And what we try and do is we try and um, not only represent um, with the House authorities and IPSA and, and any other sort of organisations how important the well-being of MP staff is, but we've put lots of support in place as well. So we've got a SharePoint site, we do monthly virtual meetings with guest speakers, um, which they've all been happy that we've recorded those and we provide those to everybody as well. Um, so yeah, we, we're just really there to try and help our colleagues who are in a very similar situation to ourselves, um, you know, to navigate what can sometimes be a very traumatic and, um, you know, difficult job to do. Thank you. And this is for both of you. How did Octopus and the Wellness Group start working together? Oh, <laughs> sorry, Kirsty. Yeah, okay. so <laughs> I was going to say, so uh, Prospect very kindly introduced us to each other. And I think that we have got a lot, uh, so much in common. 
and we've got so much that we can learn in Parliament from what Octopus are doing in-house for their staff well-being and it would be fabulous you know that we can take on board some of the uh, some of the environment that Octopus have created and bring that to MPs offices up and down the country. Do you think you've noticed um, MP staffers being more have finding their mental health more problems during the pandemic? Absolutely. A huge one, unfortunately. I mean, the pressures of, you know, having to work remotely when we were so used to being in an office surrounded by a team who you could bounce ideas off or even frustrations, having somebody who really got and understood, understood your job. Um, but also, you know, the fact that we are dealing with this in our homes and have been. And, you know, it's very difficult, isn't it? Some people have been in, you know, they've moved to London to take up jobs in Westminster and gone into shared accommodation without people that they know or having a support network around them. Others have been juggling childcare, like everybody has, as well as working from home uh, and everything else. And also, so unfortunately, sometimes we do get abusive calls or traumatic calls. And having that actually in our homes now, rather than in the office, all of that can really take a toll on people's mental health. Yeah, massively. Do you think um, people underestimate how hard it is to be a parliamentary staffer? I think people don't underestimate it because they really don't know what it entails. I think we're really quite um, under the radar where most people are concerned. Um, and you know what? We are there to support the MP in everything that they do. But people don't realise that actually we're the ones that normally take the emails, the first calls and, you know, try and get the casework going, as well as supporting the MP in their just sort of um, their chamber work and their APPG work. So I think people just don't really understand the, the complexity of the job itself. Yeah. C could you tell me about what are the particular difficulties of working in Westminster and also the difficulties working in a constituency office? What are the problems coming up in those environments? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the quite different environments, obviously, if you're Westminster based, you're in the palace, you've got all of that history. And, um, you know, every corner you turn around, you're reminded of the amazing politicians that have stepped foot in those corridors and, and made the world a different place. But not only that, as a staff member, you have, um, you have social clubs that you can go to, there's gyms there's you know restaurants you can get together with other people face to face um, with colleagues who are in similar positions and provide your own support network in that way as well as being able to access you know all the well-being that's in-house because in the constituency and, and MPs are 650 small employers so therefore the 650 small offices with some have one staff member in maximum we can fund is four full-time equivalents anyway so they're very small teams and you know you're sometimes in offices that are quite small and dingy <laughs> that don't have facilities that are are the best but not only that you don't have that bigger support network you've got your team and it's quite insular and you feel very removed from the Westminster bubble. What kind of calls would a constituency staffer get what sort of problems might they have to deal with? So the analogy I tend to use is that um, we could be dealing with somebody who um, has overgrown trees outside their house and they can't get the Sky TV signal to unfortunately rape and murder. And at the moment, the situation in Afghanistan and the way people, relatives of our constituents have been treated over there uh, is just absolutely horrendous. And we deal with anything and everything that our constituents come to us with. Um, there's a big issue around people's mental health as well and which has been increasing over the last few years and we're having to find ourselves not only you know trying to help those people navigate the mental health services and get the support that they need but actually in some ways just being there listening ear so that they feel as though they've actually been heard and not just pushed away onto a scrap heap. Thank you um, and Kirsty I know that Octopus has a great working environment could you tell me about what are the services it offers that really makes it work so well? Yeah, so um, I think the key is variety and flexibility, because when you talk about mental health and, and well-being, everybody's different, everybody's on a journey and at different stages. Um, but we have various kinds of support, but something that I think we're particularly proud of is just how we can be really vulnerable and honest with each other. So we encourage people to write blogs when they're struggling, uh, hoping, hoping to open up the kind of 
communication with everybody else to make them feel kind of comfortable. In terms of support, we, can, we have face-to-face -face coaches, virtual coaches. We have a psychologist we use because actually we like to think about how we can perform under pressure because here at Octopus, it's busy, there's work volumes, and there's life stuff going on. So actually, we, with the psychologist, we kind of look at practical things we can do to remove, to make us to be able to perform under pressure. There's various things like mindfulness, there's various things like CBT, therapy, various, but we've got literally on a spectrum from preventative, so I'm just not feeling okay, to extreme, I could be self-harming, uh, I've got more of a serious condition. So we've got everything on that spectrum um, to offer unlimited to all of our staff um, and their partners as well. How has the wellbeing programme developed over time? So it was only me originally. And then, do you know what? With the people here, they just wanted to get involved. So we built out what we call champions. We've got about 17 people across the business that volunteer over and above their day job to communicate, engage, go to team meetings, share examples of their own experiences, talk about you know new initiatives that we can kind of help with. So we kind of use staff around the business. So we've got people in each team looking out for each other because we kind of recognize different teams are struggling with different things at certain times. Do you find that there's a different way to help younger employees and older employees use different programs or different services? Uh, yes, yeah, so I definitely think um, probably the older generation probably took a little bit more time to feel comfortable talking about this. It was very much taboo um, in the beginning, but actually we worked with our senior exec team to actually ask them to type, talk about their own experiences at home. And I think that really helped. I think younger people, we have a, um, a service called Shout that you just text. It's a 24-7 line um, open available you know to everybody and I think the younger generation much prefer the kind of the text message engagement initially um, so I think there's again they're very examples but I think your question to Estelle around Covid for us it has fast forward things so pre-Covid we were using a company called Sanctus in the preventative step up space just with the volume of complexity with Covid it's now pushed us into deep therapy and deep counselling that's our sweet spot that most of our staff are using um, quite regularly, actually. What did you find the best way to build trust with employees so they felt comfortable using the services? Did that take time or was it? It did, and I think it started It started with me being really vulnerable about my own experiences um, and, and then gaining people to kind of help be honest and vulnerable. And actually, Vulnerability is a key leadership trait that we really value here at Octopus. It's one of our values. So it kind of linked with the culture we were building at the same time. Um, as I say, that there'll be some people that feel more comfortable than others, but I think the, the personal, the personal connections, the personal stories, that live, oh my God, I'm not the only one going through it scenario, is where people latch on and then engage. Thank you. And I guess, yeah, for Estelle as well, did you find it hard initially to get staffers? to sign up to wellness group programs and services or was that difficult to build the trust with different staffs across parties and things like that? So um, a little bit, yes, absolutely. And uh, one of the complexities that we have is that we don't have the IT to be able to just communicate with all staffers all at once. So a lot of it's had to build by word of mouth. So, you know, if I go into a meeting, I'll tell other people about it. And the same with the, the other committee members. And fortunately, you know, we've got quite a few members now who pass it on to colleagues. Um, th there's also, you know, we do... Um, when we're doing recordings and things, we will quite often turn the camera off and say, right, OK, you know, somebody wants to talk now or on the chat, you know, I will read things out anonymously so that people can get answers, but then don't have to feel as though they've got to share themselves or their experiences. So um, it's it's built up. It is difficult and it's very difficult to um reach everybody and I think that's our major problem and we would like everybody that sees this to you know just click on everybody's got a desktop icon now through parliament because the house services have been brilliant just click through on that wwg desktop top icon send an email through and join our um, mailing list and then we can just keep in touch and we're also there to speak to from a, a peer group perspective as well how often do you speak to some staffers 
it varies depending on what's happening so um you know when when we're all super busy at the moment as we are with um, the afghanistan crisis as i mentioned we don't have the time to think about ourselves which is you know terrible because really we all need to look after ourselves first don't we it's that basic principle of first aid put your own oxygen mask on first before you help others but that falls way by the wayside when your inbox is just constantly on the go. So um, it can vary from a daily basis to, you know, at the moment, we've not really spoken to very many people because we're all just heads down, getting on with it. And then we deal with the repercussions afterwards. Thank you. Um, and this is a question to, to you both. If you're giving advice to an employer in any office, what would you say are the main ways they can look after staff as well-being? So for me, it starts with that trust and confidentiality. So being willing to be vulnerable and available to speak. We don't expect managers or leaders to be experts in any of this, but I think being approachable, giving people the time and the space to be able to talk and know it's trusted and really confidential, I think that goes an absolutely long way. I have to agree with Kirsty. I think that's absolutely key to to it all. Um, just to add on to that, what I would say is that, you know, if you give the time to your employees, to your team members to be able to approach you and feel valued, you know, knowing that somebody's there to listen to them little things like you know if you've got to go for a medical appointment that's so important you shouldn't have to come out of your time owing or your your holidays it should be your health has to come first but that builds a strong team it builds people who are then committed to your organization and to your business as well and you'll find that your productivity and your dedication of your staff goes up if they feel as though they're valued in the workplace fantastic Thank you both so much. I uh, really enjoyed that chat. Um, please remember to enter the awards. Uh, entries closed this month um, and the awards will be held in Parliament on the 9th of November. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.